Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have some more important papers in organic synthesis. And in this video, we're going to be showing some molecules that have some pretty unhappy looking bonds. You've probably never seen a sulfur triple bond nitrogen before. I'm pretty sure you haven't seen three borons connected in a ring as a Lewis acid before, and a cyclopropene connected to a hypervalent iodine reagent is absolutely ridiculous. And these aren't just somewhat obscure reagents, they actually have some useful applications. The first topic for today is that triboran derivative. Now, it turns out that if a pyridine is present, it can complex to B3H7, which, if it has a substituent in the 4 position, possessing an alpha proton, can undergo deprotonation by potassium terbutoxide, which affords the corresponding exocyclic alkene. This is then capable of reacting with electrophiles, such as alkylating agents. Alternatively, if the 4 position is unsubstituted, nucleophiles can be added into this position, and through subsequent oxidation with chlorinyl, this is reoxidized to the corresponding pyridine. Now, the way that this reagent is prepared, or I should say the precursor to this reagent, is through the dissolving metal reduction of BH3THF. This affords KB3H8, which can be isolated also as the rubidium or as the cesium salt, if you want that for some specific reason. Now, because there's an extra hydride bound to this, it's first necessary to protonate this with HCl, which liberates hydrogen gas, as well as potassium chloride. The resulting B3H7 forms a complex with THF, which can then be substituted through the use of pyridine, and these adducts can be isolated as crystalline salts. Earlier I mentioned that if you have a substituent in the 4 position which possesses a proton, it's possible to form that exocyclic alkene which can then be alkylated by an alkylating agent. So in this example, you can see that a number of alkyl halides underwent substitution by this pyridine derivative, and it's even possible to acylate this position using acyl halides. They also demonstrated that a wide range of different pyridines could be used possessing functional groups such as this bromide, this chloride, or even these ester groups. In cases where there was no substituent in the 4 position, a Grignard reagent could be used in the presence of lithium chloride, enabling the addition of various Grignard nucleophiles. In order to re-aromatize the pyridine ring, it's necessary to use the benzoquinone chlorinyl in order to do that reoxidation. In addition to functionalizing pyridines, it's also possible to functionalize quinolines, first using nucleophiles and then reoxidizing using chlorinyl, or alternatively, fully reducing that six membered ring to the corresponding tetrahydroquinoline. In this case, Grignard reagents could be used on a wide range of substituted quinolines, which provided access to, in this case, a variety of isopropylated products. Instead of just using Grignard reagents, however, Phosphine oxides could be used, affording a range of tri-substituted phosphine oxides. They also demonstrated that the corresponding adduct, instead of undergoing oxidation, could be reduced with sodium borohydride to afford the corresponding tetrahydroquinolines. This worked not only for the Grignard substituted products, but also the phosphine oxide substituted product, shown here. Now, if you're wondering about how they remove that B3H7 group, all they have to do is mix this with methanol and water in air at 70 degrees for 7 hours, which leads to complete removal of the B3H7 group. The next paper we're going to be discussing is this obscure looking hypervalent iodine reagent, which is connected to a cyclopropenyl group. And believe it or not, these derivatives can actually be isolated via column chromatography. In this reaction, this hypervalent iodine reagent suite is able to be coupled with unsubstituted cyclopropenes to afford these bis cyclopropene derivatives. To prepare these reagents, first an unsubstituted cyclopropene undergoes lithiation by n buley followed by the reaction of this hypervalent iodochlorine species, which through the elimination of lithium chloride affords the corresponding cyclopropene-substituted hypervalent iodine reagent. Now the way that this subsequent coupling chemistry works is first we have this hypervalent iodine reagent undergoing oxidative addition to gold 1 forming a cyclopropenyl gold 3 species. At the same time 
this unsubstituted cyclopropion undergoes CH activation by silver-1, affording a silver-1 cyclopropenal species. The silver-1 complex then undergoes transmetallation, donating a cyclopropene to the gold-3 center, and through reductive elimination, the gold-1 is regenerated, and the bis cyclopropene product is formed. A more complicated version of this mechanism is shown here, and if you're interested in looking at it in more detail, you can pause the video here. Some scope highlights are shown here, where you don't just get symmetrical products, as different cyclopropenes can be used both for the hypervalent iodine reagent, as well as for the unsubstituted cyclopropene itself. In the highlights shown here, a variety of the hypervalent iodine reagents are used, which are called benzoiodoxyls. Here we have a wide range of esters, a CF3 containing example. We have a bis ester, a mono ester, a dibenzyl ester, as well as an adamantyl ester. This works not only for aliphatic substituted cyclopropenes, but we also have an example with an aryl group as well as a cyclopropyl group. In the scope highlight shown here, various different unsubstituted cyclopropene derivatives were used. Here's an example where a naphthalene was present. In this case, there's a thiophene, and aliphatic derivatives were also tolerated, but in this case, when they replaced one of the esters with a methyl group, they saw very low conversion. Despite that, aryl halides were also tolerated, demonstrating that a wide range of these bis cyclopropene products could be formed. Now, if you're anything like me, you're looking at those bis cyclopropenes and you're wondering to yourself, what the heck can you even do with those? So it turns out that if you have the bis ester monoester bis cyclopropene and you do a diels alder reaction with it, the less substituted cyclopropene possessing the monoester will undergo the diels alder reaction with 20 to 1 regioselectivity. Additionally, if you do some rhodium chemistry with these, either with the triester or the tetraester, you can get these bisfuran derivatives shown here. In this case, because an ethyl ester is present on the monoester cyclopropene, but the methyl esters are present on the bis ester cyclopropene, you end up getting an ethoxy group on one ring, but a methoxy group on the other, while retaining the methyl ester in the three position. However, when the tetraester is used, and they're all methyl esters, you'll instead get bismethoxy substitution along with a methyl ester substitution in the three position of both furans. Alternatively, if you wanted to do a dibol reduction of these bis cyclopropenes, you'll actually ring open both cyclopropenes, get an alkyne possessing two vinyl groups, and the ester groups will be fully reduced to the corresponding tetrol. So this looks like a fairly interesting intermediate, especially given that the use of different aryl groups enables different functional handles, although I'm not too sure what you could do with compound 8. Nonetheless, I thought that this was an unusual example of hypervalent iodine chemistry that was worth discussing. The third paper for today involves the formation of sulfenyl nitrines, which can be generated through a couple different means. One way is to take the use of this triaryl sulfur triple bonded nitrogen compound, which can then be reacted with sulfenyl chlorides at a low temperature to generate a sulfenyl nitrine. This can then be trapped by naphthalene derivatives, which enables the gradual release of this nitrine under thermal conditions subsequently. The reason you'd want to do it this way is because you might not want sulfenyl chlorides in your chemistry, or perhaps there's other intermediates or compounds that are present in the original sulfenyl nitrine generating reagents, which are undesirable to have in your final reaction mixture, where you're actually trying to use the sulfenyl nitrine. So that's why they trap it as an intermediate adduct to the naphthalene derivatives. One of the things you can do with these sulfenyl nitrines is you can use them for skeletal editing. For instance, indoles and paroles can undergo ring expansion to the corresponding quinazolines or in the case of paroles, you'll get pyrimidines. First, I thought it would be useful to show how this triaryl sulfur triple bonded nitrogen reagent can be prepared. And this first starts with the reaction of chloroamine T with diphenyl thioether. 
This results in the formation of the corresponding S double bond N. But in order to remove that, it needs to be treated with concentrated sulfuric acid, which is formed as the tosylate salt, so it needs to be freebased with sodium hydroxide. Once you have the S double bond NH, or some derivative of this, it's possible to convert it to the S triple bond N reagent possessing an alpha fluorine on the sulfur using select fluor. This is then reacted with phenolithium, which displaces the fluoride with an aryl group, affording our final product. However, if you don't want to use select fluor, you can instead brominate that NH using n bromosuccinamide and then through the use of TBAF, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, it's possible to form the SF reagent this way. One of these applications may be more suitable to your needs, depending on what you have in-house, or what you want to scale. So to provide an overview of this once again, we start with the diphenylthioether. This is converted to the S double bond N through the use of chloramine T. This is then deprotected with sulfuric acid, which can be converted to the NBR with NBS, and then substituted with TBAF to get the SF, or alternatively, the NH derivative can be directly converted to the SF derivative using select fluor. Finally, this is substituted with phenolithium to afford the desired N triple bond S reagent. Now, once they've made that naphthalene adduct, it's possible to do ring expansion of paroles, as I mentioned before. However, because ring expansion can happen either here or here, you'll get two different types of pyrimidine products. In the case of this fludoxianil, a 1 to 1.3 ratio of each pyrimidine was observed. Nonetheless, this could still be a useful way for generating potential compounds during a medicinal chemistry campaign, if you're trying to get some structure activity relationship, or just get some quick conversion into other possible compounds you want to test. In this case, a 1 to 3 ratio was observed, demonstrating that the presence of substituents in different positions, as well as different electronics, can slightly affect the outcome of these reactions. In the case of this pearl, only 2W prime was observed, where skeletal editing selectively occurred in this bond shown here. It's also possible to take indoles and convert them directly to quinazolines. And in this case, there is no competing two positions which can react. Specifically, the two, three positions of the indole undergo reactivity, since the remaining double bond is a part of the benzene ring. In this example, there's a biotin derivative, which was converted to the corresponding quinazoline when a substituent was present in the two and three position. However, it's also possible to have the two position unsubstituted as shown here, affording the corresponding quinazoline with a hydrogen at that position. This works not only for indoles, but for aza indole derivatives, demonstrating that this could be a useful tool for developing new compounds based on complex scaffolds you may already have in house, rather than needing to completely redesign the synthesis just to get some pharmacological data. When imidazoles are used, however, you instead obtain the corresponding 135 triazines. This worked on a wide range of different imidazoles, including on a protected version of histidine, which afforded an unnatural amino acid directly in 80% yield, which I thought was quite interesting. Do you have bigger synthetic problems? Maybe you have some synthetic challenges which would benefit from some attention from a skilled synthetic chemist. Or maybe you're working with a CRO or synthesis on demand company who's running into some roadblocks. Or maybe you're just trying to set up your own synthesis in house. I'm currently about at capacity for consulting clients, but if you have an interesting project, specifically if you have a synthesis project that you think is important or interesting and you'd like to get a little bit more attention on, nonetheless, still reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat about it, but I might have a little bit more time in Q4 of 2025. I hope this video has informed you about some new types of chemistry that may be applicable for you, or maybe it just broadens the scope of what you think is possible with organic synthesis. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.